Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 70 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Juno Diaz, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his novel The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. One of the characters from that book, Junior, is the focus of Diaz's new book, This Is How You Lose Her. Diaz was born in the Dominican Republic, which is the setting for his short story, Monstro, which recently appeared in The New Yorker's first ever science fiction issue. Then stick around after the interview as guest geek Megan McCarran joins us to discuss fiction that straddles the border between fantasy and realism. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Juno Diaz. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, man. Okay, so you were recently featured in The New Yorker's first ever science fiction issue. Why do you think they chose this moment to do a science fiction issue? That's a great question. I think, again, it, it speaks to sort of this shift in how everyone is viewing genre. I would also say that a lot of these shifts are um, linked to economic considerations. You know, it used to be a kind of a respectability thing that science fiction wasn't going to be allowed except for certain kinds of practitioners. You know, Raymond Bradbury would perhaps be allowed in the door. Ursula K. Le Guin would be in the door. But the very concept of a science fiction issue would have been anathema in previous um, New Yorker administrations. But I think that there is sort of a large generation shift in how we think about it. Still, there is also a lot of problems. Uh, so what sort of response did the issue get, and uh, what sort of impact do you think it might have? Is it safe to say zero and zero, which is to say <laughs> that it's like, I mean, really? Like, the New Yorker is going to somehow have an enormous impact on science fiction, which has the kind of fan review and critical community that very few genres have ever had. Uh, it was more of a curiosity than I think of anything, I mean, in my mind. Okay, so tell us about your story, Monstro. Well, what was that about? Well, I mean, I just wrote a story that uh, it's actually part of a novel I'm working on. It's, uh, I've been working on this kind of insane novel about a strange invader virus type thing that takes root in the poorest, hottest places in the world in the near future. And, of course, one of those places is going to be Haiti. I write most specifically about the Dominican Republic and... Uh, in that island. So I sort of had this kind of crazy idea to write a, a sort of near future story where these kind of virused up 40 foot monstrosities going around eating people and uh, taking it from there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm only at the first part of the novel, so I haven't really gotten down to the, the eating, you know, and, you know, I, I got to eat a couple of cities before I think this thing will really get going. The story, it's sort of a, a combination of a of the sort of doomed relationship story that you've written a lot of with this post-apocalyptic thing. I mean, could you talk about what are some of the challenges of combining those two elements? I, I just kind of loved the idea of these sort of overprivileged doofuses pursuing what we would call a mainstream, what we would call a literary fiction narrative, while in the background, just out of their range, though they could see it if they wished to see it, there's a much more extreme, horrifying narrative unfolding. And I guess there's a part of me that feels this way sometimes, where I'm in the Dominican Republic, and I'll go to the border of Haiti, and then I'll fly, and I'm back in New York City, and there's a part of me that thinks, wow, wow, people are living these sort of mainstream lives, and they're arguing about why the the cafe is closed, or that their pizza didn't have enough anchovies. There's this almost another generic world where frightening things are happening not far away. I, I heard you say that one of the things that drew you to science fiction when you were younger is that you had this experience with dictatorship and you only saw dictators in fantasy and science fiction books and not in literary fiction. Well, but I, I think we know as well that like, you know, when you look at a lot of the science fiction novels, there's really kind of questions about power. There's questions about what it means to have power. There's questions about what um, sort of the long-term consequences of power. When you think about the Dune novels, 
the original Dune novels start out as this kind of this this uh, Machiavellian fix-up, kind of the battle between these houses, but turns out to be a very troubling meditation on what it means to take over an entire civilization and set it on a certain path. But, you know, there were other books that just really kind of were supremely important to me where I was like, damn, stuff is happening in these science fiction books that I wasn't seeing anywhere. Whether it was sort of the Dorsai, even the Harry Harrison novels, you remember the Death World novels where they're like imprisoned in this sort of nightmare world where it's sort of like a Doom video game on crack. There was all of this extreme stuff happening that resonated with a lot of the ideas and experiences and sort of the historical shadows that had been cast from the Dominican Republic. I didn't see mainstream literary realistic fiction talking about power, talking about dictatorship, talking about the consequences of breeding people, which, of course, is something that in the Caribbean is never far. Yeah, now, now, Monstro is actually, it's the second science fiction novel that you tried to write, right? You also had one called Dark America. Oh, my God, that book, that book sucked, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I tried to write this sort of, um, before the whole uh, young adult dystopian craze, this pseudo-Akira, pseudo-post-dirty war novel about a young woman in a rebuilt city that had been blown up by some sort of strange, perhaps terrorist, psychic, perhaps not. And she was part of this whole historical recovery project. And it, it was a disaster. Well, so what was it then about Akira that made you want to do your own take on it, even if it didn't succeed? I grew up in a time, I'm 43 now, I grew up in what, only like 14 miles from New York City. I grew up in a time where nearly every day on television, uh, they would sort of show us these maps of New York City and show us the destruction zones from the coming nuclear war. You know, there would be this wonderful map and these concentric circles of doom and my neighborhood was squarely in my town, was squarely in the black of destruction. And, you know, I was part of that sort of group of kids growing up in the 80s under the sort of Reagan regime, I used to call living in the shadow of Dr. Manhattan, where we would have dreams all the time that New York City was being destroyed and kind of that wall of light and destruction was rolling out and just would just devour our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I'd always wanted to do something with that image. I mean, if you're haunted by an image for so long, there's a part of you who thinks perhaps if I turn it to art, I can at least get a two cents return on this like five million dollars of like trepidation there's been actually a lot of controversy lately over them casting mostly white actors in the akira live action movie were you following that at all oh yeah that was that was fucking the biggest joke of all you know i, I think that there is a general pattern of whiteifying everything just because they make Heimdall black in the Thor movies doesn't really make a counter argument. In fact, the the amount of what they call race bending that goes on in Hollywood is extraordinary. I mean, I have sat down with agents who will tell me straight up. They're like, listen, you write about Dominicans in New Jersey, uh, make an indie film about this, but Nobody in Hollywood wants to see anything but white leads. And so when I when I heard that they wanted to cast all white characters in Akira, it just really showed you how little the dream factory of our popular culture has caught up with the diverse reality of our present. I mean, the nation in which we live in, the world in which we live in, is so extraordinarily more like a future than the futures that were being sold on the screen and on television. So you recently wrote uh, an appreciation of Ray Bradbury in which you described the impact of uh, his story All Summer and a Day had on you. Uh, could you talk about that a bit? I was one of these kids who was an inveterate reader. You know, it was Asimov, Bradbury, Bolva, Clark, and then you would go out to Heinlein and Zelazny, and these were like the sort of 
the first vocabulary that I had as a young reader. And Bradbury was extremely important. And uh, I'll never forget that he was also one of the few writers who I was reading on my spare time that the teachers would actually bring in work for us. And I recall the same year that I read uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Those Who Walk Away from Omalas, uh, the teacher presented that story, which is kind of this amazing sort of critique. Uh, I would argue it's kind of, you know, and I, it wasn't just me. A lot of people would say it's one of the most wonderful parable critiques of our sort of capitalist moment. There was also that same, same year our teacher brought in um, the Bradbury story. And I was this sort of immigrant kid who was going through the, the pain, the sort of dislocation, the sorrow the confusion of being an immigrant. I think that um, immigration is still one of those experiences that our understanding of it is profoundly balderized and profoundly um, distorted, especially the immigration of young people. And I'll never forget reading the Bradbury story. It was came at a really great moment for me because my sort of command of the English language and sort of my understanding of American society and my sort of maturation as an immigrant had reached a point where this story could kind of come in and give me a lens through which to understand all the things that were happening to me as an immigrant, how all the difficulties that were occurring to me were not simply something that happened just to me, that there is a whole culture of childhood persecution that I think for many of us who are caught in that moment, we often think it's just us. We don't see that there's a larger context and we don't see that we're, that we're not entirely alone. And I remember reading Bradbury at that time and reading the story and suddenly becoming aware that even if this was fiction, that I felt a bond to the poor kid being locked up in the closet, that I felt that there was, somewhere else in the universe who sort of understood my difficulties, my hardship, my suffering, my own moment of exclusion and being ostracized. And not only that I connected to this character, but that there was a writer somewhere out there who was also saying, I understand this. Not only do I understand this, but here it is being presented to you in a way that will help you understand it and not just so that you're lost in it so that you could have some context that you could have some distance to it yeah and that you can see it because a lot of times bearing witness to what's happening is perhaps the most important step for us to overcoming it and you now Bradbury gave me a way of bearing witness to my own experience as an immigrant as a young immigrant going through a lot of the nonsense young immigrants put up with we're in a very when we're in a very hostile society in a very hostile climate and uh, I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And I never forgot him. American culture certainly has sort of been hostile to young geeks, but you've talked about how it was particularly hard in the Dominican Republic where you grew up. And here we've, in, in recent years in the U.S., we've seen geek culture has kind of gone mainstream. And I was just wondering, is that happening outside the U.S.? Is anything like that happening or do you think will happen in the Dominican Republic? Well, no, but I, I mean, I, I, I guess my sense of this thing about geek culture being mainstream is that I, I would be very, very cautious for thinking that simply because capitalism has decided that this is a really great area to strip mine so that it can make its big tentpole movies and so that it can sort of pad its bottom line, to think that the, the average quote unquote geek is anywhere more, is, is in any way sort of more respected or sort of less marginalized, you know? And again, and even though we now have so all sorts of wild conventions and you can go to Comic Con and, you know, they send the New York Times reporter to Comic Con, they send the Economist reporter to Comic Con. Um, and that there's, you know, there's a huge video game industry that makes billions of dollars and there's all these sort of superstar comic book writers and superstar like genre writers that are even more wildly rock stars than any of the, you know, the traditional figures from Heinlein. I mean, a China Mayville is a rock star in a way that Heinlein can probably never have imagined. Even though this is all happening, we're still talking about a minority. This is a country that still creates hierarchies. This is a country that still has a very clear pecking order in how it likes to dole out privilege. 
And I guess what I'm saying is that the day that I see someone who's writing the Hulk comic up for Guggenheim, you know, <laughs> or the kid who's writing strictly military science fiction being inducted into the American Academy of Arts, then I'll be like, damn, yeah, this this whole social economy of who's in and who's out vis-a-vis geeks has altered. But I think that there's there's a lot of economic interests at stake that have encouraged folks to let geeks sit at certain tables. But we're certainly far below the salt. And the average geek who is not making a ton of money for Marvel, who's not connected to some huge video game enterprise, or who's not one of these kind of great hotshot young writers, you know, and who doesn't find their way to a convention and isn't in a convention sort of among his own tribe or her own tribe, I still think that there's a lot of marginalization. And I wouldn't be quick to be like, oh, we have entered some sort of utopian paradise, man, because I work in the public school systems. And I'm telling you, I think that while certainly it's far more easy for somebody to be like, I'm a comic book person than it was growing up in the 80s, I I wouldn't underestimate the amount of marginalization that is still present today. Well, but and how about the situation in the Dominican Republic? Again, we're talking about a very small set of people who are interested in these things. And the larger culture sort of like scratches its head, you know. I mean, I was in Japan recently, like a year ago, doing an event um, with a whole bunch of literary people. And my translator was somebody who was kind of himself sort of a golden boy in the literary circle, the person who uh, translated all these sort of hotshot American and British Canadian writers. And um, I'll never forget that I uh, started talking about the Yamato, what we used to call Star Blazers when it appeared in the United States, how it had this kind of interesting effect on me. And um, in Japan, a country that people tend to think goes hand in hand with nerdery, that Japan's otakuness in some ways so widespread. Even in Japan, when I was in this literary circle, I started talking about Star Blazers and people were like, are you insane? My interpreter was like, yeah, people are saying that this is just children's stuff. And why are you bringing this up in a place where we're having a serious discussion? And I guess there's a part of me that thinks, you know, when I think of uh, that moment in Japan, I think of the moment in the Dominican Republic where, you know, in sort of, quote unquote, serious circles, these pursuits of comic books, of video games, of science fiction, of fantasy, these things are considered kind of like children's pursuits. Now, by everyone, no. But sort of in serious circles, yeah, I still think that there's there's that kind of generalization, that unhelpful, distorted generalization. Uh, so your new book, uh, This Is How You Lose Her, uh, chronicles the troubled relationships of a geeky protagonist. Do you think there are dating pitfalls that are particular to geeks? Well, I, I mean, that, that would probably be a mischaracterization. You, you're, you, you're kind of the kid who knows everything about science fiction, everything about role-playing games, knows a ton about video games, and yet he does not go out of his way to fly his nerd flag at all. So therefore, he's kind of a different character than, say, the, my poor Oscar character in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, who was sort of like dripping with his geekness, who was kind of like nerd into the seventh dimension. I think that one of the things that you have is you do have a lot of people like you and your who love this stuff and yet feel a little bit ashamed of it. Not all of us are as proud of reading comic books and loving China Mayville or playing video games as the others. And I think that uh, it's fascinating the way that his his identity kind of unfolds and the way that a reader, for example, is often much more aware of how nerdy Junior is than perhaps any of the women in his life. I mean, one thing I think about a lot is that how much of the social problems that geeks have is because they just don't fit in, that they would be fine if other people were more like them, but they're not. And how much actually is a matter of just objectively poor social skills? I mean, obviously, I love geeks. I am a geek. But I just wonder sometimes if there is any dark side to the sort of power fantasies and maybe over-romanticization uh, that goes with the geek mindset. And I don't know. Do you... uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, have you ever been to a Comic-Con and <laughs> seen the way that some of the sort of comic fans go after these creators who often just work for higher people? 
who are often getting, you know, mandates down from corporate telling them what you do. I mean, have you been to sort of, um, you know, when you go to science fiction or, for example, I've been to horror conventions and seen some of the kind of crazy behavior that goes on. That is, I'm not just saying crazy behavior that's kind of fun, but crazy behavior that's a little bit antisocial and certainly like fundamentally sexist. You know, you go to a convention where it's like overwhelmingly male and sort of like not exactly a safe space for women. Have you ever read the talkbacks whenever race comes up in geek kind of culture? You know, we don't want to tar all nerds and all geeks with the same brush because that's not the reality of it. But I do think that we're not a special category. We're not fans or slants, you know. We are human, and we have a lot of uh, weird stuff afoot. And I mean, certainly folks who are marginalized can be as oppressive as anyone else. I mean, I always say there's always this thing in Santo Domingo that there's nobody more oppressive than the oppressed. And certainly few of us would want to be female characters and say most military science fiction. I don't know about you. I would want to be. I mean, the average science fiction writer who writes sort of like pseudo-futuristic, pseudo kind of uh, what we would call Blade Runner-ish type work. I mean, Jesus Christ, how often are the women characters either raped, prostitutes, or have some kind of weird sexual abuse thing going on? You only have to talk to people of color who are working in these fields. You only have to talk to women who are working in these fields, and you hear some of the challenges that they have. And how some of the stuff that um, sort of gets tolerated um, among our circles, that wouldn't be tolerated at all in the mainstream because there's already these mechanisms. I mean, the most recent thing that happened at ReaderCon was deeply, deeply disturbing. Now it's sort of shaken up a bit. It's starting the right conversations we need to have. But I don't think it was a – I'm not shocked that there was this kind of flagrant case of sexual harassment at a place like ReaderCon. I mean, I've been to ReaderCon. I love ReaderCon. Most of ReaderCon is this fantastic, brilliant convention, but mm, there's also a lot of weird stuff where you get a lot of guys together, and even if they're geeks, whether they're geeks or not, a lot of guys together in one room and no sort of mechanism to sort of handle this stuff, well, you're going to have serious, serious problems. And I think that this is why creators like Alan Moore like Hideki Anno in anime are so important to us because they're people who look the culture in which they operate, the geek culture in which they operate. They look it, they look square into its shadowed heart and see not only what's good about it, what's exhilarating about it, the promise of it, but what's incredibly dangerous about it, what is sort of retrograde about it, what in some ways is toxic about it. Where something that I find beautiful, that I find interesting, but that I myself think is plagued by a lot of uh, shortcomings and shortcomings that we can fix, shortcomings that I think a lot of us are really interested in fixing and in addressing. And it's generational, too, because, listen, there are more women, people of color, queer folks with each generation. I mean, certainly now in the what we would call the nerd or geek arenas that there were when I was a kid. And I think each generation brings us more promise of diversity and brings us more promise of a, of a better climate for all nerds slash geeks, you know? Yeah. And speaking of writers of color, I mean, I saw you say that one of your ambitions was to be like a Dominican Samuel R. Delaney or Octavia E. Butler. Um, yeah. Could you just talk Did about Did I actually say that? That's so deranged. <laughs> I think that that was one of my younger ambitions. Sort of like when you used to have a dream about going to Shaolin Temple, you know, <laughs> me trying to be Octavia Butler or Samuel R. Delaney really is like the 40 year old guy wistfully thinking about how if only he had run away when he was 14 and gone on a steam tramp ship off to Hong Kong and from there slipped across the border into the new territories and gone up to Shaolin Temple and practiced his wushu. My God, <laughs> if only I'd done that, I'd be already the absolute master killer. I mean, let me tell you something. That tramp steamer has sailed and gone, my friend. <laughs> I'll be lucky if I can write another two books before I'm like in the grave. Uh, these writers are absolutely remarkable and important. And the 
depth of their metaphors. And, you know, when you think about what science fiction does best, whether we're talking about Suvin's idea of the novum and or, you know, um, all the different ways that people approach, you know, the, the central force of science fiction, these sort of metaphors that allow us to address sectors or areas of our reality that aren't being addressed, that aren't being openly discussed, that are cloaked in silence or taboo. And I look at both of them, and I think that they have done wonderful jobs of exploring our realities and exploring our anxieties and dreaming of futures in a way that allow us to better see our present. I mean, they're absolutely indispensable, you know, and they certainly have given me a vocabulary of which to think about my present and my future as a person of uh, African diasporic descent and just as a person living in the U.S. I know I'm working on a book right now that's kind of this this sort of apocalyptic, giant monster, zombie virus invasion story that might not ever come together. But if there's anything that's useful and good about that, I certainly would love to put that at the feet of these two um, writers. Uh, so are you familiar with authors like uh, Nello Hopkinson and Tobias Bakel who, uh, who write fantasy and science fiction using Caribbean themes and characters? Of course. I mean, uh, Nello's my girl. I saw Nello just a couple days ago. Somebody I've been reading since she first won that aspect contest back in the day for Brown Girl in the Ring. And of course, Bucknell. I mean, Bucknell, is, uh, he's uh, someone I, I started reading immediately because of the stuff that he was doing and the way that he was kind of weaving in the sort of Antillian uh, reality into his work. I mean, really, really great stuff. Listen, you can't go wrong with somebody who has uh, a set of characters or a, a kind of a, a group called the Mongoose Men. I'm, I'm in. Mm -hmm. I'm in. I mean, compared to where we were 20 years ago, it's it's really, really, really promising. And then we've got Jemison, uh, N.K. Jemison, who's fantastic. I think each generation brings more to the table, and hopefully this trend will continue. Uh, let's see. So back in episode 55, we interviewed Michael Chabon, and he talked about how in college he wanted to write science fiction, but his professors forbid it. Did you have experiences like that in school? I was very fortunate. I had, as an undergraduate professor, a brilliant, what we would call a mainstream science fiction writer, um, though, of course, now they just cast him as mainstream, a brilliant genre writer. His name is T.E. Holt, who published a collection of genre short stories called In the Valley of the King. You know, we start off with a, a spaceship on its way to Jupiter that has lost all power and it's going to go crash to a story about a meteor that's going to smash into the Earth. And these are the last months before the the inevitable doom and um, really, really remarkable stories. And he was very, very encouraging about my sort of genre taste and my genre interests. When I sold my first book, Drown, I actually had a dual contract. I sold my book, Drown, and I sold a three-part science fiction and fantasy series, a more popular version of the Gene Wolfe Shadow of the Torturer books. It was going to be this kind of like dying earth type setting. And so Drow was supposed to have come out. And then like a few months later, the first book was supposed to come out of this trilogy. I mean, I still have the contract. It is still in force. The problem was I never could rewrite the damn first book. Um, I realized that the, the first book, which was hilariously, predictably and stealingly enough, named Shadow of the Adept. I could never get around to writing it. It was to rewriting it. It was so bad. The draft was so terrible. And yet they still gave me a contract for it because they were like, you know what? This is actually pretty promising. If you could only like take out all the what's bad and rewrite it in a kind of thorough way, we might have something tolerable. I always had this dream that I was going to be this kind of this switch hitter that I was going to be one year writing a book like Drown, the next year writing Shadow of the Adept. <laughs> and it never came to be. I moved so slow. And so then, of course, what ends up happening is that, you know, what I'm known for is always my uh, mainstream work because I'm unfortunately pretty bad and seem to be very slow at any of my genre work. 
Yeah, so you currently teach at MIT, uh, which I would imagine would expose you to a lot of science fiction fans. Uh, is that true? Or Yeah, I mean, it's I, I wouldn't overplay it, though. You'd be amazed how many of my students would be what we would consider mainstream. For example, I'll have a creative writing class, and I will say, okay, uh, we're going to do a science fiction assignment. And two-thirds of my students will be like, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested in science fiction. Hmm. I used to dream that I would go into an MIT class and I would say, we're going to do a science fiction assignment. And the kids would put on like bubble helmets and they would put <laughs> out their like tin ray guns. But nope. It's amazing. Even at a place like MIT, there's been so much of a transformation of MIT from sort of like a, a kind of a boutique nerd school to a more of a mainstream select college. But on average, where are there more sci-fi nerds than there are, say, when I was teaching at NYU a year ago? Hell yes. Are there as many as I wanted? No. I really did think I would be able to literally form a sub-club, fans of Dune, you know, and mm. we would have like 500 members, but that wasn't to be, you know, or fan, the Samuel R. Delaneyists, but that didn't happen. I don't know if you've ever been over there at their science fiction book club library that they have. They have one of the most extraordinary collections of science fiction that you have ever seen, assembled by student fans over the last, like, God, like three or four decades. It's extraordinary. Everything that you could ever want is there. And it's upstairs in the student center. People are downstairs in the student center playing pinball and buying slightly out-of-date milk. And upstairs, there's every damn book you could ever want. Mm -hmm. If we ever get a plague apocalypse, I am going to set myself <laughs> up as the king of that library. Uh, so speaking of the apocalypse, I, I saw that you teach a class on the post-apocalyptic literature. Um, how did that come about, and like, what, what sort of books do you uh, use in your class? Well, again, as I said earlier, I kind of grew up during the 80s, which was uh, a, a time ripe with uh, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic narrative. I was in the theaters when Terminator 1 came out. I was in the theaters when Blade Runner came out. I was in the theater when Red Dawn came out. You know, I grew up with The Last Babylon. I grew up with War Day. You know, I grew up with The Earth Abides. You know, all the John Christopher novels, which was, he was one of these great apocalyptic writers. I grew up with John Wyndham, another one of the, the Brit Doom Boys. You know, I grew up with his Kraken Awakes. I grew up with the Chrysalis. I grew up with what was called the Midwich Cuckoos, but became Village of the Damned. And so I kind of grew up surrounded by this culture, and therefore, it's no surprise that when given an opportunity, I turn around and teach that class at MIT. And it was actually, I've got to tell you, it actually went really, really well. I never realized there were so many young people that were equally possessed by this dread and fascinated by it, too. Maybe our last question will be, uh, what are some of the most obscure geek references in your work, and have there been any that you worried were just too nerdy or obscure? There's a reference there in the novel to um, M.A.R. Barker, who is a role-playing game designer and a kind of a Middle Eastern Tolkien and a novelist. He created the empire of Tecumel, the Tecumel world. There were two novels that were published by Daw. One was... Um, I think the Man of Gold and the second one was Flame Song. It was sort of like a Middle Eastern meets Urdu meets Mesoamerican future world where a human empire had spread to an alien world and colonized it. And then the human empire collapsed and humans were stranded in this very, very hostile world. And they've rebuilt their civilization to an almost pseudo medieval level. But of course, the culture is entirely like South Asian, Middle Eastern, and, you know, he has this remarkable mythology, this remarkable world, and he created this series of languages, a la Tolkien, Soilani, um, Mughaluani, I can never pronounce them, but I can spell them. And again, they were like science fiction, sort of in the light of Gene Wolfe, where the science fiction is so advanced and the culture in which it resides is so collapsed that they view it as in mystical terms. In his world, there were two sets of extra-dimensional beings that humans worshipped as gods, and they were called the gods of change and the gods of stability. And there's a reference in Oscar Wilde to the change and the stability. And I think only one person has ever written me and told me, hey, I love those uh, M.A.R. Barker novels, too. Hmm. All right, 
Great. So Juno Diaz, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Gentlemen, thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Juno Diaz for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned for our panel today, we'll be discussing fiction that straddles the border between fantasy and realism. And we're joined by a special guest geek, Megan McCarran. Her stories have appeared on Tor.com, Clark's World, and Strange Horizons, as well as in numerous Year's Best anthologies. She's an assistant editor at Unstuck, a literary annual focused on literary fiction, with elements of the fantastic, the futuristic, and the surreal. So Megan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm very excited. And I guess we should just start off by defining a couple terms. So one of the terms that you kind of need to know is slipstream, which was coined by Bruce Sterling to describe this fiction that sort of occupies the middle ground between literary fiction and fantasy and science fiction. And recently, John Kessel and James Patrick Kelly did a book called Feeling Very Strange, the Slipstream Anthology, which sort of attempted to define what slipstream is. The slipstream question is interesting. I mean, now it's it's an over 20 year old definition at this point. And I think Bruce was really trying to talk about trying to capture the strangeness of being alive in sort of postmodern late 20th century America. I mean, I think in Bruce's mind, like the quintessential slipstream text would be like pattern recognition or something in some ways. As far as the quintessential slipstream goes, uh, it could be that in book form, pattern recognition uh, could be argued for that. But um, in short story form, um, in the anthology, actually, uh, Kessel and Kelly included a story by M. Rickert called uh, You Have Never Been Here. I actually reprinted that in Lightspeed at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and and I mean, they they argue that it's the quintessential slipstream story. And I would actually really agree. Um, it's a very strange story. Uh, it's a story that I read and I loved immediately, although as soon as I finished reading it, I really I really didn't wasn't quite sure what I had read. And uh, and I and I went and I actually read it back to back like three times. Um, and I'm still not really sure entirely. I know what's happening there, but it's like a really strange, wonderful experience to read. And I think that's sort of like what makes it feel like it's quintessential slipstream. And then another term that gets bandied around a lot is interstitial. And there's the Interstitial Arts Foundation, which I think is sort of getting at the same idea, this idea of the region between clearly delineated topics. Do you guys have any sense of why the term interstitial came about? Is it different from Slipstream in any way? I mean, ultimately, I think they're talking mostly about the same body of work. I think the work itself is resisting labels or is trying to sort of get around traditional labels. And like, so as a result, we keep trying to sort of pin it down in different ways, but neither definition is like quite satisfying enough. But I know interstitial arts is also really about playing with form. Is it a poem or is it a story? Is it fiction or is it nonfiction? As well as just mixing genres. So I think that's another really important aspect of that conversation. One thing I wonder is it seems like the terms slipstream and interstitial, are these only terms that fantasy writers use? It seems like whenever I use these around people with no connection to the fantasy field, they have no idea what I'm talking about. I used to think that. But now that I've been... um, you know, I'm getting my MFA and um, Unstuck, we went to AWP, um, Associated Writers Programs, which is sort of the big academic creative writing conference. And lots of people there know the term slipstream. And people will sort of ask me about my work, like, oh, so do you sort of write slipstream? Karen Russell talks about slipstream a lot, which maybe is part of the reason. And like a couple other people who are pretty well known fantasists. So I see it as terms that sort of were coined within the realm of science fiction and tend to have a bit more understanding, but they are traveling, it seems, actually. When I was at Clarion, actually, one of our instructors was James Morrow, and he made this point that a lot of the best fantasy being written these days is being written by people outside the field, and so you should really venture out and and see what else is out there. But I wasn't really sure how exactly to do that. And I came across an interview on Strange Horizons that Ben Rosenbaum had done with Amy Bender. Mm-hmm. And that was my first introduction to her. So I read her collection, The Girl in the Flammable Skirt. And then when I um, was at USC, I was at USC and C.C. Boyle and Amy Bender are both um, in their graduate program there. And so I just kind of went on Amazon.com and saw, you know, if you like Amy Bender, you might like this. <laughs> and just kind of started going through that those. And that's how I found Karen Russell and Judy Budnitz and Stacey Richter. I mean, there's also, you know, writers like Karen Joy Fowler, Maureen McHugh, Kelly Link, um, Michael Shaben, obviously, and, and Jonathan Latham. And like, 
this writer named Amelia Gray, who writes this like super fantastical, very playful um, flash for the most part. And again, like they've almost all appeared in literary magazines. She has had a novel come out from FSG. And so maybe like she just wouldn't be on any genre person's radar because she's not publishing where they're reading, but they would probably really get a kick out of her stuff. And I mean, actually, that's what we're trying to do with Unstuck is sort of really try to bring together both communities and like really like pull some genre authors who we know not enough literary people know about and pull some literary authors who we know not enough genre people know about and just bring everybody together and get everybody really excited about each other's work. Um, I mean, that's one of the things I think about as an editor when I'm doing something like Lightspeed, which incorporates both originals and reprints when I'm looking for things to reprint. I often will look at things that appeared in like literary markets or whatever. So like uh, while typically I, I'm reprinting something that's a couple years old because I don't want something that was just sort of freshly published somewhere where where my readers may have seen it. So I, I wouldn't reprint anything recent from like FNSF or Asimov's, for instance. But like if I read like the latest issue of Tin House or something and I, I want to reprint something out of there, uh, assuming the rights are clear, there's nothing that's not me from reprinting that because it's like, I mean, the readers, the crossover and readership between like Lightspeed and Tin House is probably very, very small. So uh, for the majority of my readers, that would be a brand new story. You know, so, I mean, I, I really like being able to find stuff like that, that I feel like something that is like basically just published as a literary story, but would feel just as much at home in one of our genre markets um, if it just had been sent there. Uh, there's a lot of anthologies out there that are like basically collecting this type of stuff together. The anthology that won the World Fantasy Award last year, um, my father, he killed me. My mother, she ate me. Something like that. It's, it's, yeah. I can't remember which way it is, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's like a fairy, a contemporary book of fairy tales. Um, and some of them are reprints. Some of them are originals. But um, it really mixes together literary fiction with genre fiction in a way that is, uh, you know, basically perfectly suited to what we're talking about. And, and Kate Bernheimer's Fairy Tale Review, the woman who edited that publication, is also fantastic. And um, there's also uh, this great novella press that I discovered at AWP called Dorothy press they are like they do a couple novellas all by women and most of them are very experimental and very fantastical i just read a book of theirs called in the time of the blue ball which is this like crazy french post-apocalyptic tale about pe like like they're, like one of the characters is like a giant blue crab with fuzzy claws like it's just out of this world and wonderful and you know i think that lots of genre readers would get a total kick out of something like that I think it's interesting with fairy tales because it seems like there's still sort of the center of literary fiction is still realism and you kind of need an excuse to get outside that or like a, a pretext almost to get outside it. And fairy tales is one of the things that's permitted. It's like if you tell a fantasy story in a fairy tale voice, mm -hmm. you can incorporate a lot more fantasy elements and get away with it. I mean, that kind of Amy Bender has a very sort of fairy tale voice to her stories. Um, you think about like Angela Carter. Or I just read one um, by Ludmilla Petrushevskaya. But it, it seems like there is still an, a resistance to just out and out fantasy that there's always got to be some it's got to be a fairy tale voice or it's got to be surreal or it's got to be ironic or, meta, you know, very foregroundedly metaphorical. Whereas if it's just a story about some dwarves going to kill a dragon or something, that's not going to get into a literary magazine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly seen that sort of pattern. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I encounter when I am looking through sort of literary markets or whatever for potential reprints or just to read, uh, is that I find like a lot of the times the, the stories, because maybe the authors also have this, uh, idea of that's what the literary editors are looking for, or maybe just that's what just ends up being published. But I, I find a lot of the stories just they're not like genre enough for me. And I mean, which is not to say that they need to be. It's just that, like, to entertain me as a reader, like, I feel like the elements are there, but they're not strong enough in the story. When I see the story, it's like, well, this is very nicely written, but the cool stuff is in the background too much, and I want them to bring it more to the foreground. And 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 it's almost like because they wanted to publish it in a literary journal, they had to, you know, sort of hide it back there. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And, I and like, this is something that I certainly noticed. I think I noticed it from, like, I'm never, like, oh, this isn't genre enough, but I think I am aware of like when sort of the mundane details of, especially of the characters' relationships are foregrounded versus like foregrounding the really exciting, like eyeball kicking kind of genre elements. And I'm always wondering like, yeah, like, like where does it come from? Is it a conscious thing? Like it, or like it seems more literary to have it be primarily about like, 
you know, this couple breaking up, even though they both have superpowers? Or is it, you know, because the writer sort of reads more stories about foregrounding psychological realism or style, and then they enjoy genre, but maybe just aren't as versed in like the traditions of it. So they don't want to foreground it in their story, you know, or is it just that it's hard to achieve a balance as a writer between like, I'm going to focus on interiority and, you know, sort of the mundane experiences of, of emotion and, and what, and like, you know, the techniques of psychological realism, but I also want to have everyone, you know, be able to turn into ducks. So <laughs> how much do I write about the ducks? And how much do I try to get inside the mind of a person who can become a duck and they love another duck, but then they also love the swan, you know, that's a type of dexterity that's difficult to develop. And we also don't have a language or sort of talking about how to do that. I mean, I think people love Kelly Link's work so much because she commits equally to like, the crazy genre elements and like focusing on like what's going on inside the character's head and sort of using those psychological realism techniques. And so I wonder if it's just that like, because this is a coming together that we're still watching happen, people don't quite know how to put these elements together yet. I actually, I, I want to make the point that when I use the term literary, I don't mean that in any way as a value judgment that mm -hmm. a lot of times people think that what makes a story more literary is that it's better written. You know, there's just, there's just kind of a style that you can read a story and be like, oh, well, this is sort of a literary fiction type of style. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 for example, I would say that, you know, Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun or mm -hmm. China Mievel's Perdido Street Station are as well written as anything I've ever read, but yes. they're not mm -hmm. literary. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have that kind of everyday people kind of vibe that the, tends to be sort of so tends to be part and parcel of the literary uh, and it actually really bothers me when genre fiction is sort of denigrated as not having an interesting style. Cause some of the most like banana shit I have ever read is genre fiction. I mean, like stars, my destination is like style to the roof, you know, mm -hmm. um, or something like, um, Theodore Sturgeon, you know, or, um, Philip K. Dick. Like it's like style is totally part of genres heritage and wordplay and, and experimentation with language and joy in language. I mean, sort of when I was growing up, if you if someone had said the words of fantasy story, what I would imagine is a guy with a sword in a pre-industrial society with supernatural elements. And now if somebody says a fantasy story, at least in short fiction, I tend to think of like a Kelly Link story. You know, you, you tend to have sort of everyday characters leading, leading everyday lives. And there's just like weird stuff kind of going on. Not quite Zombies not quite. in the convenience store, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that certainly is is true for the most part. I mean, sure, still there are some short stories in the genre that you're going to find that are going to have, you know, a guy with a sword going to kill a dragon or something. But I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's one of the things that really was something that was took a lot of getting used to when I first started reading short fiction magazines because, like, I would I would find like FNSF and uh, fantasies the you know it's the it's the first word in the title and yet and like i would pick up the magazine and it, it really took me a while to figure out what it meant by that because um because yeah I, I was also thinking of fantasy in terms of like epic fantasy or you know sort of sorcery type of fantasy and yet there's this whole other type of fiction that's being written and published a lot like in in the genre magazines um that is this sort of like like you were describing it i mean it's basically literary fiction with some sort of uh, unrealistic element added to it and, you know, ultimately, like, you start studying the genre and stuff, and you see all these definitions, and um, you read definitions of what science fiction is, and what fantasy is, and it's like, well, fantasy really is just fiction in which impossible stuff happens. And th and that's just something sort of that takes some getting used to um, when you grow up, and, and, and fantasy is what is, you know, it's sort of like an extension of D&D &D in book form, you know? It's like, that's basically what my idea of fantasy was growing up. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, you know, it, it, it did occur to me when I first started working in the field that, like, it really kind of seems like there should be a different term to describe what this is. You know, because, yeah, like, a Jeff Ford or a Kelly Link story, like, has as much in common with, you know, like, a Conan the Barbarian story as, you know, <laughs> like, you know, apples and oranges. So it's like, it's, uh, I, I probably should have came up with a nice uh, science fiction metaphor there, but. It, it is kind of strange that it's all lumped together as fantasy because, yeah, I think a lot of readers who, who find the magazines or, or, or anthologies and they see that it's a fantasy anthology, you know, they go into it with very different expectations. Um, and some of them will like it, some of them won't. But 
It's true. You know, it's striking to me that um, so much of the talk around Slipstream ultimately comes down to fantasy as well. Or like, you know, we're sort of like, okay, fantasy is really running a broad gamut here. And I do think that's really true. But I know with Unstuck, like we've really been trying to also have science fiction stories that don't read like the traditional science fiction story. Because I think, you know, like how to how to live safely in a science fiction universe is totally like the science fictional version of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, like, you know, Jeff Ford's name came up and he's written a number of stories that have traditional science fiction elements like robots (laughs) and aliens and stuff. But they're so weird. I mean, they have much more of a slipstreamy kind of vibe to them one of his more science fiction stories that still very kind of has a weird vibe is this story called The Far Oasis. And it doesn't seem to be the most popular of his stories among other people, but I found it really unforgettable. But the premise basically is that there's this guy and this woman betrays him and he murders her. And then as punishment, he's exiled to this alien world where he's alone on this island with all these primate aliens. And he has a laser rifle to defend himself. And these primate aliens reproduce very quickly. And so what he starts doing is going around the island, shooting all of the aliens who look the least like this woman. And because they reproduce so quickly in 10 years or something, they all evolve to look like her. So he's on this island with all these replicas, basically, of this woman that he fell in love with and murdered. And, oh, that's just so creepy, that story. And like we mentioned Karen Russell, um, my favorite story of hers is this one called From Children's Reminiscences of the Westward Migration. And it's sort of like, you know, Oregon Trail. It's kind of like that, except the father of the family is a minotaur. And so he's actually pulling their covered wagon himself. You know, he's like the ox pulling the, the wagon. But it's not, it's not really a fantasy story. It's more of a surreal thing where nobody really thinks it's out of the ordinary that there's this minotaur. You know, they don't really, I mean, except that they, uh, they look down on him a little bit, but it's this more dreamlike sort of treatment of the subject. I mean, my favorite Kelly Ling story is Magic for Beginners. The protagonist is like, you know, a teenage guy and his his father is a horror writer. And then he and his friends are all obsessed with this TV show starring a woman named Fox. And so there's just all these embedded narratives, all of them fantastical, all within the same story. That's also referencing Borges' Library of Babel. You know, the horror writer father writes all these stories with spiders, like giant menacing spiders. And then Fox is defending this fantastical library. And then he and his friends are also having these sort of surreal experiences. So I think one thing that I really enjoy about, about this kind of work as well is that it's often able to sort of comment on the experience of genre stories or comment on genre stories or using genre elements at the same time that it's also telling a really satisfying story. But we're just sort of raised in a culture of knowing every genre and subgenre of storytelling, right? Like we're in a very storytelling focused culture, even though we often sort of say that everything is dying. So I don't know if like people who are interested in like taking this from this literary writer that they love and taking this from this genre writer that they love and trying to make something new with it, like if they have more of a self awareness of genre boundaries or, you know, if that's just something that happens organically. So, I mean, I notice we're talking mostly about short stories. Is that Does that just reflect our tastes, or do you think there's something intrinsic to Slipstream that just makes short stories a more natural home for the form? When the Slipstream anthology came out, I think I actually interviewed Kessel and Kelly, and, and I'd, asked, um, I'd asked them, you know, well, what are the sort of quintessential novels? And, and, and they basically said that, yeah, that, I mean, it seems to be something that lives mostly in the short fiction realm. And maybe that's changed since um, since the anthology came out because it was a couple of years ago. But now, maybe within the definition of slipstream that Castle and Kelly were using, it doesn't quite fit. But I think that there are novels that are definitely doing the same kind of work. And actually, especially when these novels are published within the genre, um, they don't tend to get a lot of attention. Like, there's a writer named Brian Francis Slattery. I don't know if you guys have read his work. Um, yeah, I just read. Um... Oh, what was it called? The, I read it for my post-apocalyptic book club. Um, Liberation. Liberation. Or the new one. There's a new one that's post-apocalyptic, too. The same I'm blanking on. It was the new one. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I, yeah, I, I, I do know him, yeah. Yeah, so, like, um, Brian, you know, Brian's work is, is very sort of slipstreamy, and he, only, he mostly writes novels. You know, I mean, his first book is, is Spaceman Blues, which is 
this very linguistically playful, narratively playful story about an alien invasion, basically in New York City. Liberation is about like, what if the apocalypse was an economic collapse? And um, I actually haven't read his new book, but... Um, I'll I've just a- say quickly, the reason I can't come up with the title is because I joined, I, I found out that there was this post-apocalyptic book club that met in Brooklyn. And I found mm-hmm. out about it the day before they discussed this book. So I read the book that day. <laughs> so was it, in, was it in Red Hook? Because I yeah, think yeah. I read Liberation for the same post-apocalyptic book yeah, club. Right. <laughs> but so I only spent one day on this book. <laughs> so the title didn't really stick in my head. And I actually spoke at that same book club when, uh, you know, after Wastelands came out. Oh, so awesome. we, we've all participated in this book club one it's way like or another. It's like the Kevin Bacon of book club. <laughs> yeah. It was, awesome. It's at Freebird Books, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freebird, yeah, which also has really, they have a great selection of used books. But yeah, and I, I mentioned How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe. I would mm-hmm. say that's a very slipstreamy novel. I mean, even Brief Life of Oscar Wow, um, Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wow. I think is really looking at border, like the borders and genres, looking at the borders between people. Um, maybe slipstream is a bit of a stretch because the actual fantastic in the text isn't really present, but, or something like um, Chronic City. I don't know if you guys have read that, but again, like it's very much capturing what it feels like to live in early 21st century America, the inherent strangeness of that by mixing the fantastic and the very mundane. So I think it's definitely something happening in novels, maybe not as obviously and often as it does in short fiction, but mm-hmm. it's definitely something that I would see there. Well, like, and I know, I mean, Amy Bender and Karen Russell have both written novels recently. Right. Yeah. The Peeler Sadness of Lemon Cake is um, totally a, like, you know, <laughs> a, a very genre bending substreamy novel. I haven't read Karen Russell's novel yet. Yeah. I mean, and she's, and she, you know, Karen Russell said that that novel is a very, clear homage to geek love by Kathleen Dunn, which is 20 years before all of this stuff is happening. But again, I think could be a really interesting way to, to look at slipstream through the lens of a novel like that. But I do think it's interesting how many of the foremost practitioners of slipstream haven't written novels. I mean, Kelly Link and M Rickert, for example. Uh, I mean, Ted Chang also doesn't have a novel, but oh, yeah. uh, that, he was he was the one uh, inclusion in in the slipstream anthology that actually really questioned. I, I you know, we we actually just talked about it in the last episode. But his story, Hell is the Absence of God. I that's just the one story in that book that I was like, I can't see how this is slipstream and not just a fantasy story. Well, and it's interesting because just speaking of interstitial, that Ted Chang is fond of saying that he's a completely stitial writer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just sees himself as a science science fiction writer and coming out of that tradition and doesn't see himself as. Mm-hmm. striking out into <laughs> yeah. new territory and, or anything. And I would say, I mean, I've been at Sycamore Hill with Ted for years now and like his critiquing style is very much like a science fictional, like, okay, so did you build your world right? Does this make sense? Does that follow? Does this character conflict make sense with this, you know, element of world building that you put in? Like he's very coming out of that, like plot and plausibility critiquing tradition as well, which is really, you know, um, not something you always see with people who are quote unquote interstitial writers. It's great. It's it's terrifying because he always finds all like the five billion holes in my plots. But mm-hmm. <laughs> well, another thing I wanted to talk about is that I fa- you know I um, teach writing to sort of high school college age students, and one thing I had I kind of have to wrestle with is that I'm not sure what to tell them about what kind of career path that they should choose. I mean, because if you have somebody. Somebody like me, I mean, I like writing stories with sword fights and parallel worlds and, you know, stuff like that. So I was kind of, you know, I was always going to be a, a, a proud fantasy and science fiction author. But when you have people who they mostly write stuff more in the Kelly Link, Amy Bender vein, uh, and they're pursuing a career as a fantasy writer, I'm not sure whether I should tell them, no, you should be trying to establish yourself as a as a literary writer, sending stuff to literary magazines, not to fantasy magazines, because, you know, somebody like Karen Russell does a lot better, I think, publishing stories in, in literary magazines like, like The New Yorker, uh, obviously, than if she were to sell those same stories to Strange Horizons, where they would fit in just as well, but have a much smaller audience. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough question, because, you know, I mean, I, I don't know the literary marketplace that well, but I mean, I know it's a lot it's like sort of a lot more crowded and a lot harder to get any traction there. 
and and a lot of these places it's actually you know there's actually even less money than there is in the genre market but you know but yeah you know i mean the thing is it, it is a really important decision how to position yourself because if you want to be considered primarily like a literary writer quote unquote as opposed to a genre writer when you make your first sale i mean that could really be that could really follow you the rest of your career i mean some writers sort of start off in the genre and then end up in the literary world like jonathan lethem did but i mean that's by far the exception to the rule you know like i mean i've talked to my wife about this because she sort of writes stuff that's uh, on the on the literary side of things and some of the books that she's talked about writing are you know some are more genre oriented and some are more sort of feel like a literary novel with with fantasy elements and and I've said, you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would kind of encourage you to to work on the one that's, you know, the more literary first, because once you publish that first literary thing, you know, in at least a novel, I mean, and she's already been tainted by genre by publishing short stories. But I mean, you know, in terms of the novel world, sometimes you can sort of, uh, you know, get around that by not having any books out. But then, like, once you publish that first novel, it's like, you know, you're either going to be a genre writer or a literary writer. And, and, and if you publish as a literary writer, you kind of have a lot more freedom to do other things whereas if you're a genre writer it's going to be really hard for you to break out into the literary world well and didn't you publish your first story yeah i did so it's like you're you're the one who <laughs> i know i ruined her i think it's different when it comes to short fiction versus novels because like short fiction doesn't have like book scan no one's going to look at how your last short story did before buying your next one. And like, you don't even have to mention in a cover letter, you know, where your work has appeared or you can, you know, list markets differently depending on where you send something. So I think with short stories, it's really just a question of like, where do you want to put your effort in and, and why, you know, are you trying to get a teaching job? I mean, Nick Mamatas has talked really articulately and, and compellingly about this that like, Science fiction pays five cents a word, you know, which blows everyone in my MFA program's mind. Like when I tell them like, oh, I sold a story to Tor.com so I could like afford to move to Austin. They're like, what? You know? <laughs> well, in Tor.com, don't they pay 25 cents a word? Yeah, they pay a lot, um, which is nice. But then on your CV, those don't count the ways like, you know, having a story in Gulf Coast or, or even like, you know, bigger markets like something like Tin House or One Story. So if you're trying to find a teaching job, then you need to be thinking really differently. If you're trying to get grants, if you're trying to go to McDowell, you know, then you do want those literary credits. But that's about where it shakes out. I mean, with novels, it's, yeah, I think that it's a different question. And unfortunately, people are, it is easier for people to start out at a literary house and then move move around rather than than jump up into that. And I think that that's super fucked up. But I totally agree with John that that does seem to be what's going on. Um, you also see this with YA. I used to work at a bookstore in New York City and like the difference between, oh, they had like three books for adults at this like really respectable literary imprint and now they're doing a YA novel. Isn't that so great that they're lending us their talent versus like huge superstar, great YA writers, but like you would have more trouble convincing people that these books were like of some kind of quote unquote literary merit. Yeah, so that's definitely a dynamic in the publishing industry and like one of the nastiest ones in my opinion. I know like like Ian Banks actually uh does publish successfully um both as a literary writer and as a and, and as like a as a super super hardcore science fiction writer. I mean, it's like it's not like this is like only barely science fiction stuff. I mean, like his science fiction is like hard ass science fiction, you know? Like in and in the UK primarily where he's from, um, you know, I mean, he's like a he's like a bestseller as a literary writer. You know, I don't know how much trouble he had uh, making it, uh, you know, having that uh, sort of dual career. He does publish science fiction as Ian M. Banks and then publish literary fiction as just Ian Banks. Well, but I mean, but again, he established himself first with The Crow Road, you know, with mm -hmm. his first literary novel. And then his publisher wanted him, wanted him to have a pseudonym for his science fiction to keep it secret. And just adding the M was as far as he was willing. That was the concession he was willing to make in that direction of having a pseudonym for his science fiction. But one thing I wonder, you know, like with, with the students I'm working with, if, if you're talking to someone who's 16 now, right, and you're explaining mm -hmm. the way this stuff works, by the time they're my age, that's going to be almost 20 years in the future. So who knows? I mean, is this is this stuff still going to be the same way in 20 years from now, do you think? That's that's a really depressing thought. I don't know. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I hope it's not like this uh, in 20 years, assuming that there's a publishing industry in 20 years. 
it seems like it's sort of getting better. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I think short fiction can kind of help with this because with short fiction, it's a lot easier to blur the boundaries, you know, between literary and genre fiction, you know, because I can do a book like Other Worlds Than These or whatever. And, you know, a very sort of genre focused uh, theme. Yet, you know, there's like a lot of literary type of stories in there. I mean, Magic for Beginners is in there. And then but then also like there's a Joyce Carol Oates story in there, you know, and I mean, she's published plenty of genre fiction. But I mean, her stuff is always sort of far on the literary end of the spectrum. So it is it, we are making progress into to, to where um, it's not going to have that same stigma, of, you know, the same genre stigma for for writers who want to write both. But um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly not quite there yet. And, and I mean, and, and your mileage may vary as you attempt to do it um, yourself as a writer. But. But there's also sort of the big, the elephant in the room is the Academy, right? Because so many writers are now supported by the Academy. And if the Academy and the granting organizations and the literary prizes are still sort of focused on a narrow category of fiction, like that is also, if that expands, that will also be a game changer, which I think Juno talked about a little bit as well, right? And I mean, this may just be a a relic of my social circle, but my sense is that everyone in academia these days is who's my age or younger is a big fantasy and science fiction fan. And so I really see a sea change in that when those people get up into the higher administrative positions. Yeah, well, it'll certainly be it'll certainly start to make a lot of progress once those people, like, as you say, they start teaching and they're not going to hopefully they won't be banning their students from writing genre fiction like, you know, like some of our guests have talked about um, when they were coming up. I know the writer, um, EJ Fisher, um, he's at the Iowa program right now, um, getting his MFA and he's teaching a class on like writing science fiction for the undergrads, you know? So, you know, certainly I think hopefully we'll, we'll be seeing more things like that too, or it's like actually a conscious offering, like, Hey, let's talk about this genre specifically as writers. Uh, so Megan, why don't you just tell us, uh, what's coming up in, unstuck uh do you have issues in the pipeline do you have big plans for the future or anything like that so unstuck's literary annual um, our website is unstuckbooks.org our second issue is coming out in november it's going to be a big chunk of fiction and poetry wonderfulness we have work from I don't have a table of contents in front of me, but we have work from Jonathan Latham. We have stories from Elizabeth McCracken, Jedi Barry, Brian Kahn, um, a couple of really exciting new emerging voices as well. Um, it's going to be, I think, almost 500 pages of, you know, genre bending fiction. It should be really, really exciting. Subscribers will get that for just 12 bucks a year. And we also had a massively successful kickstarter i think we raised over twelve thousand dollars so issue three is definitely in the works <laughs> all right cool so i think we're going to wrap things up there so megan thanks for joining us thank you so much for having me this was a lot of fun and thanks again to juno diaz for being our guest today since our last episode two new people have left us five star ratings on itunes bringing us up to 186 they didn't write reviews, so I can't thank them by name, but rest assured, the two of you, that your feedback is greatly appreciated, whoever you are. We're really hoping to get up to 200 ratings by the end of the year, so if you enjoyed the show, please find our page by typing Geek's Guide to the Galaxy into the search bar in iTunes, and then press the Click to Rate button to add your own rating. Also, all of our old Geek's Guide to the Galaxy episodes are now available on YouTube, so if you have friends or relatives who are confused by that whole downloading thing, you can just direct them to the YouTube versions. Alright, so that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, Hell, no one. Thank you for listening.